What an amazing truth to sing and proclaim through song, regardless of everything that happens to us in life, that we have uh, a promise that Christ will indeed hold us fast, that Christ will keep us, guard us till the day of His coming back. So we gather together to celebrate that fact. This morning we're going to be continuing our time and uh, studying through uh, the book of Mark. And we're going to be looking this morning at Mark chapter 2 beginning in verse 18. I would invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word from Mark chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 18 uh, through 22. It's the word of the Lord. It says this. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And the people came to him and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guest fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth onto an old garment. If he does the patch, tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed. And so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. Would you please be seated as we pray? God, we ask that you would now, even in this moment, send your spirit to bring to light the truth of this text. We understand that we need you to reveal your inspired word to us. God, if we are to receive this word and apply it in our lives in a way that continues to transform us, we need your spirit to do that. And so, God, we pray in this moment that that would be the case. God, that you would help us to see truth from your word that you would help us to be transformed by it. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we live in a world that despises absolutes. Our, our culture worships relativism. Tolerance is held as the highest form of morality. We live in a time where very few politicians have enough intestinal fortitude to say without qualification things which are absolutely true. We live in a time where even, even asking a, a, a politician to, to say without reservation or without qualification something like abortion is murder is, is seen as, as controversial. I mean, we can't even live and exist in a society where we can all agree that murdering the most innocent among us is a bad thing. I mean, it, it seems absurd if we look at the, the political climate and the debate that it's like things which even just maybe 20 years ago or 30 years ago or 50 years ago, relatively short amount of time in recent history, everyone could have agreed upon universally. Now we have to qualify. We have to discuss in, in nuance and detail, and we have to give sort of conditional statements because we live in a culture which despises absolute truth. We live in a time where individuality and self-expression and diversity are, are valued as higher than objective truth. And I would contend that there's never been a time in our nation's history where we are more in need of bold men who will stand and proclaim bold truth from God's Word in the pulpits of American churches. Even in the church. We've become pluralistic. We've become passive about that which makes Christianity distinct from the world. So let me be very clear this morning. And what I'm convinced that Mark is teaching us in this very passage of Scripture, that biblical Christianity is completely and totally incompatible with every other religious system. I think Mark's teaching us something by way of this depiction of this interaction between Jesus and the Pharisees. He's wanting us to understand that the biblical faith of, of Christianity, this, this worship of 
Christ as he's revealed in the scriptures, it's incompatible with every other religious system, with every other secular worldview, with every other system out there. You, 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 can't, you can't take Christianity, you can't take truth from God's word and sort of morph it into your everyday life and adapt it as part of a, a greater system that you subscribe to. Jesus wants the Pharisees to know that what he has come to do and what he has come to proclaim and what he has come to perfectly accomplish, it is unique. It's new. It's different. It's transformational. And it is incompatible with any other system that is out there. You can't blend genuine faith in Christ with any other form of worship. Biblical Christianity It's incompatible. It's incompatible with Islam. It's incompatible with Hinduism. It's incompatible with Buddhism. It stands against secular humanism. It stands against nature worship. And it stands against self-worship in this age where we are taught that what we should do is coexist. And I agree, in a sense, we ought to be willing to coexist. But Jesus wants to make it clear he didn't come to coexist as one of the gods that the world will worship along with all of their other gods. He came to do something unique. It's interesting also that biblical Christianity is not just in, in, incompatible with false religion and false worship of false gods that totally reject Christ, but it's also incompatible with those that profess a, a false faith in Christ, a wrong understanding about who Jesus is. Mark wants us to know that Jesus didn't come to make people better. He came to transform people into something new. Jesus didn't die to make bad people good. He, he came and, and lived and died to make dead people alive, to accomplish something new. Not to simply reform an old and outdated and archaic way of thinking, but to show us something new. It's true with us as individuals. It was also true with the Jewish system that existed during the first century when Jesus lived. Mark wants us to know that Jesus didn't come to add something to this form of Judaism that was being practiced. He he didn't come to to bring a new wrinkle or a new nuance that they might just sort of graft Jesus in to their already religious system that they were practicing. He didn't come to reform Judaism. He came to bring God's grace. He came to usher in a new covenant purchased in his blood that God is now going to interact on a different basis. With those who profess faith in him. Jesus came. The form of Judaism that was being widely practiced. The form of Judaism that was being promoted by the religious elite. Was a totally works based system. They believed and they taught that salvation comes to those who meticulously follow the law. They believed wrongly that the purpose of the giving of the law to Moses, to God's people, the people of Israel, was that the law was given that they might be made righteous through strict and meticulous, disciplined obedience to the law. They didn't understand. The purpose of the law was not to make Israel righteous, but to reveal to Israel how desperately unrighteous they were. The purpose of the law was not to cause Israel to be puffed up with pride in their own uh, uh, self-ability to keep the law and perfectly uphold the law and look down upon all others who didn't have the law and were either unwilling or unable to keep the law. No, the law was given so that Israel might see God's perfect standard and understand just how desperate they were for someone to come and make them righteous, understanding there is no righteousness in us. They believed they were righteous. That's why the the comment, if we look back at the passage we looked at last week, is such a, a damning indictment in the passage when Jesus looked and he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Jesus went on to say, I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. This is the condemnation of 
self-righteousness. Jesus was saying, listen, I didn't even come to save people who already think they're righteous. They are outside the scope of being able to be saved. You can't be saved if you believe that you are a good person on your own. You can't, believe, you can't be saved if you believe that there is a righteousness to be obtained through disciplined obedience to the law. I think it's important before we sort of launch into this week's passage to understand the, the context. In, in verse 18 of our passage this morning, Mark tells us that John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. The people came and they said to him, why do John's disciples, he's speaking of John the Baptist, he had a, a group of people who were following him, those who had been led out into the desert, baptized with a baptism of repentance, of preparation for the coming kingdom of God. And they're saying, they're coming to Jesus, and they're saying, listen, John's disciples, those followers of John, they, they fast regularly. And these disciples of the Pharisees, they fast regularly. But we notice Jesus that you and your disciples, you're not observing these fasts. What's going on here? I mean, they themselves were sort of already articulating, you're doing something different. This that you're teaching and this that you're teaching your followers to do, it, it's different than, than what we do. There is a uniqueness about these things that you're advocating. I, th- I think it's important for us to understand, if we remember back to last week's passage, we looked at the call of, of, of Levi or Matthew, the tax collector, that Jesus goes to the most vile among them, the most despised and rejected, that which righteous Jewish elite were prohibited from interacting with. He he goes to a man, Jesus, who who was actually prohibited from entering the temple to worship because he was the vilest of the vile, a, a traitor against Israel. And Jesus said to Matthew, follow me. Matthew left and he followed him. It goes on to tell us that after Matthew follows Christ, forsaking all that he is and all that he has to walk with Jesus, that Jesus actually goes to Matthew's house. And they're, they are there. Jesus is, is sort of found there at, at this party, this feast, this gathering of sinners and tax collectors. It, it, it's the first in this series of questions where the Pharisees are asking, why does Jesus do the things that he does? Why is he feasting and eating and partying with tax collectors? Why is he hanging out with those unrighteous sinners? Stands in sharp contrast to the religious piety of the Pharisees. While Jesus is feasting and partying with sinners and tax collectors. They are abstaining from food, practicing this pious exercise, seeking God. This would have been immensely controversial. It's important for us as we think about the nature of this question to understand just a little bit about fasting this morning and how fasting would have been viewed in in the time that Jesus was was interacting in the first century. Fasting is is a spiritual discipline where the believer abstains from food in order to bring greater focus on or, or greater attention to seeking God in prayer. We see fasting all throughout the Old Testament. We see fasting all throughout the New Testament. So the point of this passage is absolutely not that fasting is a bad thing. No, fasting is a good thing. We saw the prophets frequently go into the wilderness and fast in order to, to seek God. We saw the people of Israel fasting as a response to mourning in a time of deep duress and in troubling and disturbing times. The people of, of God would, would withdraw from food in order to focus uniquely on God. We see the church in the New Testament fasting. We saw the church in Acts fasting in a season of seeking God before they would send out missionaries. We see the church in Acts fasting in seeking God before they would call elders or appoint elders to serve in the church. And we see the Lord Himself fasting for 40 days after His baptism before He enters into a season 
of ministry leading ultimately to the cross. We see the prophetess Anna fasting regularly, going to the temple as she's seeking the Christ child. Or we see the the birth narrative of Jesus. So fasting is not viewed as a, as a negative thing by any stretch of the imagination. Fasting is an important spiritual discipline that the Lord has given. It seems to function uniquely among God's people during times of two, two sort of specific circumstances. It's times of mourning and times of seeking God in preparation for some spiritually significant event. It's appropriate to fast. But I think one of the things that we need to understand from this passage is that there are appropriate times to fast, and according to Jesus, there are inappropriate times to fast. And we don't know a great deal about why John the Baptist's disciples were fasting. There's not a tremendous amount written about that. It's likely that as John was continually preaching a message of repentance, of preparation for the coming Messiah, that his disciples were fasting regularly in anticipation of the coming kingdom. John is withdrawn to the wilderness and people are flocking out to him to be baptized. John's message really is twofold. Repent, the kingdom of God is coming. That's it. It seems like it's likely to conclude that John's disciples were fasting as a season of preparation to prepare their own hearts for the coming of the Messiah. But the fasting of the Pharisees was quite different. Pharisees were expected, it was mandatory for Pharisees to fast Twice a week, every Monday and every Thursday, the Pharisees did not eat. It's interesting that in the Old Testament, Israel was only required to fast on one day a year. There was only one day a year for the people of Israel that they were actually required to fast. And that was on the Day of Atonement, the day that the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies and make sacrifice in the very presence of God for the sins of all of Israel. And as all of Israel was sort of uniting their hearts in this season of repentance, as the high priest was preparing to enter into the Holy of Holies and make sacrifice on their behalf, the people of Israel were required on that one day, once a year, to withdraw from food, to fast, and to mourn and grieve over their sin, which required the high priest to enter into the Holy of Holies and slaughter an animal on their behalf. There's plenty of other examples of voluntary fasting. The Pharisees... They, they did what Pharisees do. It's the nature of, of legalism to sort of take the, the requirements that God has given and say, you know what, if one day a year of mandatory fasting is a good thing, then we think really what we ought to do is expect, in fact, require God's people to fast twice a week. This, this con- concept of, of mandatory fasting, it, it is unique to Scripture outside of this one day a year when the people of God were actually expected to fast. Instead of once a year is required, we think in order to really be spiritual, you should probably fast twice a week. And we know from other biblical accounts of Jesus interacting with the Pharisees about fasting that when they did fast, they often made a great show of their fasting, made a great public ordeal of their fasting so that others might see how spiritual they were. In Matthew 6, 16 to 18, Jesus said this, speaking to, to the people, to the masses, the Sermon on the Mount, he says, when you do fast... Do not look gloomy like the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they've received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. The Pharisees would walk around heaping condemnation on people and always looking for opportunities to seem somber and serious and pious. 
There's suggestions that show that the Pharisees would even use sort of ancient forms of makeup to make themselves look more hollow and, and more pale so that people might look at the Pharisees and go, oh, those poor Pharisees, they're starving to death in their religious devotion to God. Look how pious they are. You can imagine why it got under their skin. And they see Jesus feasting partying, celebrating what we believe to be the conversion of Matthew with a feast. So in the context in Mark 2, it seems to be the people questioning, why is Jesus attending a party with sinners and tax collectors while the disciples of the Pharisees and John are fasting? Look at how Jesus responds in verse 19 of our passage this morning. It says, and Jesus said to them, can the wedding guest fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. It's an interesting statement. Jesus automatically sort of launches into this parable speaking about a, a, a hypothetical uh, bridegroom. Now we know he's not speaking truly hypothetical, he's speaking of himself. He's asking a question. This was a common sort of form of argument in, in, in the ancient world. You, uh, you come to me questioning me with a question. Well, I'm going to answer your question with a question. And Jesus answers their question with this question. Can the wedding guest fast while the bridegroom is with them? He looks at him and says, who in their right mind would fast when everybody knows it's, you're in a unique seri- uh, a period of celebration? He's asking the question, Can you fast at a wedding? Does anybody, would anybody in their right mind go to celebrate a wedding and fast? Now we've got to understand that weddings in this culture lasted seven days and they were categorized by immense feasts and the people would gather together and it was a a great and joyous time of fellowship and feasting. And so Jesus asks a question, why would anybody fast at a wedding? You don't fast at a wedding. A wedding is a time of celebration. You fast on the Day of Atonement because that's an appropriate time for people to fast and mourn over their sin and seek God for the forgiveness of their sin. Jesus answers this question. He responds by asking who in their right mind would fast at a wedding. Everyone in that culture would have known the Pharisees do. The Pharisees actually would fast at a wedding. They were required, remember, every Monday and every Thursday to fast as a show of their piety and their devotion for God. And a wedding festival would last an entire week. And so if a Pharisee was gathered together at a wedding festival on Monday and on Thursday, the the Pharisee would say, well, you know, it's great that you all want to celebrate. But I can't celebrate today. Today I'm fasting. Look at me. I'm so pious. I'm so spiritual. I'm so uniquely close to God. I'm so disciplined that I can come to a wedding feast with the finest of food, where the fattened calf has been slaughtered and the finest wine is being served and all of the preparations have been made. And I can come and I can gather together and abstain because I'm so spiritual. There actually was an ancient Jewish rabbinical teaching that prohibited fasting at weddings because hypocrites like the Pharisees would show up at a wedding and say, well, I'm so sorry, I can't eat because I'm fasting. We've got to understand in this context, this was a rebuke against the Pharisees. Jesus says, can the wedding guest fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. Jesus says, this is a time of celebration. Listen, here's what I want us to hear from this initial response of Jesus, is that Christians ought to be the happiest people on the planet. I think this is an indictment against us. Because I think sometimes the world looks at us and they see us like the Pharisees. Like, oh, those Christians walk around going, oh, look at all the stuff that you guys do that I don't do. And all this stuff that I don't do, it makes me closer to God because all of my efforts make me closer to God. Listen, Christians ought to be the happiest and most joyful people around. Christians ought to be the most fun at a party. 
Because we understand that we have a relationship with the bridegroom. Our freedom from sin, our freedom from the law, our freedom from tyranny, our freedom from a pursuit of righteousness through meticulous observation of religious rules and expectations has been purchased by Christ at the cross. Jesus is condemning the Pharisees. Now, you don't come to a wedding and tell the bridegroom, I'm so pious, I can't participate in this celebration. He says, nobody does that. Verse 20, he actually goes on to foreshadow his death when he says, the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast in that day. He says, right now I'm here. I've come to do something new. I've come to bring God's grace in a unique way. I've come to enter into a new covenant with God's people. I've come to purchase a people for myself. And I'm going to do it because I'm going to offer myself as a sacrifice on their behalf. He's, He's telling them, listen, the bridegroom is going to be taken away. And in that time, fasting as a response of mourning in in response to your sin, that's an appropriate thing, but not now. We ought to be people who live a constant life of celebration, understanding that our freedom has been purchased. You know, free people, I I believe this is true politically in in a secular sense, but I, I absolutely believe it's true in a spiritual sense. The free people are the happiest people there are. I if you've ever interacted with people who are truly oppressed, truly downtrodden, truly beaten down, controlled, every aspect of their life controlled. You know, these, these, these pictures of, 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 of slave prisoners working on the, the chain gang where they, they have to ask if they can make eye contact with with the warden of the guard, and they have to ask, can, 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 I, can, I go to the, can I go to the restroom? Can I get a restroom break? Can I, can I eat? Can I take a drink? Is it okay if I take a, a sip of water? They need permission to, to do everything that, that they can do. But listen, free people aren't like that. Free people are different. We celebrate when we want to celebrate. I'm not trying to, to get overly political, but I find myself during this time of COVID just being shocked at the way that we're responding to various events. I saw someone ask on Facebook, are our kids going to be allowed to trick or treat this year? And in my mind, I thought, this is America. I don't need the government's permission for my kids to dress up and ask for candy. We're free. And if that's true for us as Americans, how much more is it true for us as Christians? We're free. We're free from everything. But we're free from even the penalty of death. Listen, Christians ought to be the happiest, the most joyful, the most celebratory. Christians ought to be that group of people that are willing to throw a party at the drop of a hat because we've tasted a freedom that the world can never know. Jesus goes on in this parable to try to help the Pharisees understand, though it's veiled, that something unique is going on. He says in verse 21, No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth to an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does... The wine will burst the skins, and so the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. Jesus says, listen, the old ways are gone. Something new has come. He's trying to help the people understand, I didn't come to reform this apostate form of 
Jewish religion that was being practiced. Now, make no mistake, this is not what God intended. The religious Pharisees and the elite had taken the pure and true worship of God as it was given in the Old Covenant and heaped condemnation on God's people for generation after generation after generation, adding to God's laws, adding to God's commands, adding to God's requirements, worshiping as if it were the doctrine of God, the traditions of man. Jesus is going to specifically condemn them for this in a few weeks when we look at Mark chapter 7. But here he gives them this parable, this analogy. I'm doing something completely new. This idea of salvation as a free gift of God's grace to all who believe, both Jew and Gentile. This righteousness that's obtained apart from the law. This righteousness that's obtained by believing in me through grace that God will actually impart righteousness to all who turn from sin and trust in me. He wants them to understand this is something new. It's something totally different. And you can't just blend the new with the old. The message for us is that we can't just try to incorporate Jesus into our already great existing life. We can't sort of say, you know what, I want to take materialism, and I want to take selfism, and I want to take all of the false forms of worship that I've been practicing for my whole life, and I want to add Jesus to them, and I want to prop Jesus up as one of the idols that I will worship. No, Jesus is saying, listen, I came to do something new. I came to do something unique. I I didn't come for righteous people. I came for sinners. I I didn't come for those people who believe that they are not in need of a physician. I came for the people who will come to me like that leper and understand that I am unclean. But Jesus, if you'll touch me, you can make me clean. He came to save broken people. Desperate people. Nobody, I don't think anybody that I've ever interacted with is more joyous, more filled with the fruit of the Spirit, more filled with righteousness than the one who is uniquely understanding of the desperate nature of their situation apart from Christ. The one who was walking as a slave to sin, but has been set free because of the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. So Christians, my message to you this morning is to rejoice. Live a life that's categorized as rejoicing. Let the world see us as people Not that are walking around as the Pharisees do, trying to show the world how pious we are by abstaining from certain things. And we go to church every time the doors are open. And look at me, I'm reading my Bible all the time, constantly. And I only listen to Christian music. And I only wear Christian t-shirts. And I only do Christian things. And I only associate with other Christians. And look at how pious I am. No, let the world see us rejoicing in the freedom that's been purchased for us in Christ. Let the world see in us a group of people who understand that we were desperate and we were broken and we were dead in our sin and enslaved to it. But because Jesus lived a perfect life and willingly went to death on a cross, we've been set free. So this morning as we turn our attention and our hearts to the Lord's Supper. Let us come around the table as people whose freedom has been purchased. Among other things, the Lord's Supper draws our hearts forward to a time in heaven at the wedding feast of the Lamb where Sinners and tax collectors 
and broken and desperate people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation will be gathered together around the feast of the Lord at the table of the Lamb and celebrating together what Christ has done on their behalf. Let's pray together as we prepare our hearts to come around the table of the Lord in a time of celebration. God, we love you. We need you. We celebrate this morning. We rejoice that we who were the vilest of offenders against you and against your law, we who were sick, we who were broken, we who were needy, we tax collectors and sinners, enemies of yours dead in our sin, we've been given new life. God, as we prepare to come around the table in anticipation of this great feast of all those who have been redeemed in Christ, God, we pray that you would give us cause to celebrate. Lord, we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you guys to come up.